All right, we are live uh, for the first time in a very long time. I'm going to just throw this to no 24 7 message board so our message boarders can interact with us real quick. I'll count us in for the real pod, but we are live. Say hello to anyone watching us. Say hi, guys. Hello. Hi, guys. Good evening. <laughs> great, great job, Zach. Nailed it. Hey, Zach's still coming down from that dental surgery. Give the man a little slack. We decided to pop him full of pills for this podcast. I think that was the, the best way to handle this professionally. So obviously we're coming to you on Tuesday evening because we're going to be talking about Chris Parson decommitting. We're also going to talk about where the quarterback room goes from there. So that's what we're going to be diving in on this podcast about this evening. Oh, well, Chris, thank you for uh, jumping in for me there. I appreciate you're it. You're welcome, buddy. And I know you're doing things. I am. I'm bouncing around doing some things. Uh, OTB live reaction. All right. Three, two, one. Welcome to On the Bench. I'm your host for today's episode, Brendan Sinone, joined by Chris Nee and Zach Blostein, both still on vacation. So this is a very important episode for us to disrupt your guys' vacation. Uh, welcome, fellas. Good evening. Again. Well, not everyone who's listening to this heard the... It's watching the live. I know. I'm just having a little fun with it. So, All right, so, so we, like I said, we're here to talk about one thing and one thing only, quarterback recruiting, right? Okay, so we're stream we're streamlining this, right, Chris? That's what we're getting to is you want me yep. to focus yep. on one All thing. All business this evening. Okay, let's talk about it. So Chris Parson, FSU's quarterback commit for almost a, a year. It was last July he committed to the Seminoles. Yep. Chris and I were at ten, ACC kickoff. 10 days shy. Uh, I knew you would have done the math. I knew, I knew, I knew that was going to happen. Uh, so he just decommitted from Florida State. Uh, about an hour ago, he put up an announcement over social media. Chris, do you have that in front of you as to what Chris I Parson do. said? So the graphic, which he put out via Hayes Fawcett and on three, said, Florida State has been my favorite school since I was a little kid. I spent a lot of time imagining myself wearing the uniform, but the reality of needing to be in the best place that suits me for my college career has led me to look elsewhere. I wish Coach Norvell and the Seminoles the best going forward, but I am decommitting with that underlined from Florida State and reopening my recruitment. All right, so very first thought, and we can go from here, uh, th this ultimately felt like an inevitability. This felt yeah. like something that was always going to happen at some point or another, agreed? Yeah, since May, what, 24th or so, when FSU extended offers to Brock Glenn and Ricky Collins, showing that they were kind of opening up their quarterback board and definitely pursuing two and being real about that in the sense of truly pursuing others. Yeah, that, that began a trend that has led us here, what, six, seven weeks later? Um, I think it was kind of inevitable. I think we all saw it coming. Despite the two visits, Chris Parson took two visits in June to Florida State. He came for the elite camp on an unofficial at the start of the month. He did speak after that event, spoke with Bud, Bud Elliott of 24-7 Sports at that time and uh, shared his thoughts, and people have, I'm sure, read that in the past month. And then he returned at the end of the month for an official visit. Now, in the in-between, he took an official visit to SMU and an unofficial visit to Mississippi State. Something that's worth mentioning pertaining to that subject is that when the offers from FSU went to Brock Glenn, what? What's the shaking heads? Oh, oh sorry. No, no, we, you, you just keep we, going. Sorry. We can. All right. Sorry. sorry. It's uh, a show within a show, Chris. Just, yeah, just keep rolling. Um, so after FSU extends the offers to Ricky Collins and Brock Glenn, which I believe May 24th is the date for that, within that next week, we see – Chris Parson tweeting about offers from SMU, Mississippi State, and I believe Cal was the other one. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he took the visits to SMU, an official and an unofficial to Mississippi State, the night of talk, Top Dog Camp, which is like their elite camp event, but he did not work out in that camp. And uh, our Mississippi State site has reported recently within the past week that he was expected to return to Mississippi State later this month for another visit. It wasn't clear if that was for a camp, an event, or an official just that they expected him back in. Another thing we saw here recently from Chris Parson is that he was re-offered by Virginia Tech. I presume his initial offer came from the prior staff there in Blacksburg. His new offer came from Brent Pry and his staff here just recently. So, you know, it, it, Parson gave us plenty of clues that, you know, if FSU is going to have sort of a wandering eye, well, so am I. And it's led to what ultimately came about this evening. Zach, you dropped a crystal ball. I don't know if there's anything that you want to talk about specifically on that, but uh, but go for it. Yeah, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I just kind of want to say that I feel like this saga kind of started when um, I put out that infamous article in February 
that Dante Moore, five-star quarterback, now committed to Oregon. Um, funny enough, Kenny Dillingham's new school uh, was going to be on campus at Florida State for a group uh, kind of you know tour thing. Um, he did end up making it on campus, but I don't know if everyone remembers at that time when I posted that article. That's you know within a few hours, just from reading the headline, I was told um, you know Parson removed all FSU stuff from his Instagram and Twitter bios, and you know it was it was a pretty big deal at the time. Um, and I think Brennan and I we we came on the pod, and I'm sure Chris chimed in too, and kind of said that you know I don't I w- I don't think this is going to be the last of of kind of turmoil between two sides if you know something like that were to spark things up so easily um and as we've seen uh chris referenced that that end of may timeline of fsu offering two new quarterbacks and then uh in in turn chris parson you know posting his new offers um you know we we saw that kind of the the beginning of the end um for for the relationship uh, of chris parson and fsu um and then this all you know comes to a close obviously today when parsons Parson, officially. <laughs> hey, it was the guy in the chat. <laughs> I didn't do, not do that on purpose. <laughs> so yeah, um, it, it's interesting you bring up the Dante Moore football hut bed visit. I mean that that was sort of the first moment of it happening. It felt like to some degree, uh, subsequent visits, conversations between Chris Parson and his camp and FSU that that got calmed down, sorted out, and whatnot. But. Then other things happen, other things arise, and it's kind of a reoccurring theme. And at some point, you know, you're you're either in because you want to be in for whatever reason, and you're fine with whatever else is going to transpire, or you're not. And uh, you know, he made his decision. He put his statement out. I think it's pretty straightforward. Wish the young man well and whatever's next. But you know, it's not. This evening is no way a surprise. I, I think we all sort of expected since that last week of May it was coming and with how things got weird and uncomfortable in June with uh, conversations, comments, you know, FSU bringing two quarterbacks in who were not committed to FSU for officials on the same weekend, Chris making it in at the end of the month for a visit, which, you know, up until he truly was taking a visit the day of, we were a little unsure if it would even occur for the very reason we thought he may not end up in the class. You know, the fact that we're here now on what, July 12th or so, I don't think it surprises anybody that's been keeping up with the situation. The the Dante Moore was, I think, the beginning of the end of the exact articulated that well. Um, I think that's really ultimately like for Florida State, and, and no one has directly told us this, but I think just based on, on actions, uh, that was an alarming sign uh, that your quarterback and your perceived bell cow of the class uh, kind of backed off publicly and didn't handle that level of competition well. And I think that's something – that personally, just someone who's evaluated and, and focused on covering college football for a decade plus, that's just at that position specifically at quarterback. And I said this when it when it happened to so I don't feel like this is a piling on type of deal, but uh, now that he's decommitted, but at, at quarterback, uh, you just, that needs to be unwavering, unflinching, uh, needs to be someone that you can hitch your wagon to as a program. And, uh, and that was the first sign of it not happening. Uh, and then FSU goes through spring eval period, sees Chris, sees other quarterbacks. I think ultimately makes a decision based on the spring eval period is that, you know, they, they like Chris. Uh, I don't think FSU is excited that he's leaving the class. They were certainly open to taking two, but also felt that they needed to add another quarterback and largely, largely because uh, if Chris was the guy, if he was the guy that the staff thought was going to get them to the next level and to, uh, assure or as close as you can in, in the college football world, like assure uh, positive things happening on the football field. Then I don't think you go out and you offer a second quarterback. You, you took a risk here, a calculated risk to open up your quarterback board, to expand it, knowing that there could be some sort of consequence with Chris Parson eventually decommitting. And uh, that's ultimately what, what, what this led to uh, as this is happening. I'm kind of workshopping this as we go live fellas, but to me, just uh, from the, perspective of this program like i feel like a level of relief that this is done partially because this was always inevitable like like we've said uh but also because it just it, it felt untenable and it felt toxic to an extent uh, i don't know how you guys feel on that but that's more or less when i saw the the commitment edit i was like okay that's probably honestly for the best at this point 
Yeah, yeah. It, it became, I think, a difficult situation for both parties to play a little devil's advocate. I mean, a young man was committed to FSU for, what, eight, nine months before anything really changed uh, mm-hmm. when the Dante Moore situation came up. And, then and was obviously... loyal, wasn't posting offers yeah. or anything so, like that. So mm-hmm. I'm sure it was tough pill for him to swallow of, you know, they're doing this. They're going to entertain other quarterbacks, offer other quarterbacks. So I get that. Like, that's not the easiest thing. But at the same time, that position is one that you kind of hope the competitiveness bubbles up over the top of everything, supersedes everything, I guess is the best way of describing it. And kind of makes all that other stuff meaningless and doesn't matter. But, you know, if, if it's my kid or whatever in that situation as a quarterback, I think it probably – I get some of why Chris Parson and his camp were as they were here for the last couple of months. Yeah, and I was just going to chime in. Um, you know, I think the worrisome part about about the Dante Moore thing was that the reaction to, to that art or to that situation was just based on an article. Like the kid hadn't even visited and, and stepped foot in Tallahassee yet. Um, and even leading up to that visit by Dante Moore, FSU wasn't, you know, Tony Tokras was not actively recruiting Dante Moore. Um, so, you know, if that, if there was the communication there, if it was healthy, um, that would have just got, you know, smoothed over. But they saw the headline um, and, and they reacted to it. Obviously, this stuff is all, you know, blown over with. It's not a huge deal. Um, but I think providing some context as to what led up to this is important. I um, mean, I think that was, as we mentioned at the time, very worrisome um, that that just the headline of an article would, would cause that reaction. Yeah, and, and I think, and I guess I don't, I don't want to get into to the specifics of it, but some things in, with Chris's camp and and Chris himself is well regarded uh, throughout any any program that's recruited him. I think everyone really likes Chris and yeah. how he carries himself. Uh, there are some concerns with maybe people who are in his ear planting. Uh, planting negative things uh, about him. And I don't think that's that's not just FSU source. I think that's multiple coaching staffs uh, have felt that way. So uh, again, when I mentioned it being an untenable situation, there were some things that that made this uncomfortable uh, for multiple parties, I guess, in the last couple months. And I'll leave it at that for, for right now. Uh, I guess, fellas, this isn't – I don't know if it's a coincidence or not that Chris Parsons' decommitment edit comes out a day after crystal balls started dropping – uh, for Brock Glenn to Florida State, uh, our Auburn site, we had a, a publisher put one in of uh, Brock Glenn to FSU, and we had two Mississippi State writers do similarly. Uh, so let's transition to to Brock Glenn and I guess what happens at quarterback moving forward to Florida State. Uh, Chris, I'll throw this to you uh, since I think you've been doing some some ball crystalline of your your own this evening, which is surprising to me. Yeah, the sabbatical is over again. Um but no, I threw one in for Brock Glenn this evening. I also put one in for Chris Parson in Mississippi State. I think that's the most likely destination as of this evening. But and ju- I don't just to, sorry to interrupt, Chris, to clarify, you put one in for Brock Glenn to Florida State. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Um, in sure. the case of Glenn, we mentioned offered in late May, visited, I think it was around June 10th. He was one of two quarterbacks to come in that re- weekend. Ricky Collins, who was also offered on May 24th, came in that weekend. Uh, as things kind of proceeded after that June 10th weekend, you know, Elite 11 and whatnot. It was kind of clear that Ricky Collins, at least on the surface, was saying, I'm solid to Purdue. FSU, probably not going to be it. LSU is one that most people think could come in and make that interesting. But it does not seem that FSU is a factor in Ricky Collins. And I don't know if that's a Ricky Collins decision, FSU decision, a mutual decision. Not sure. I don't know. Don't really care because I was just – it was clear to us coming out of that weekend that Brock Glenn was more likely the guy they were going to pursue going forward and that they truly wanted to get in the class. Um, in the case of Brock Glenn, sorry, I always read comments that Sinone feeds in here, and it, it makes me pause. It's it's awful TV, I know. But uh, in the case of Brock Glenn, visited FSU weekend of June 10th. He has also been to TCU, Auburn, Ohio State. Ohio State offer came a little bit after FSU. They get a quick visit. LSU offer comes around the time of the Ohio State visit. That causes pause in the recruitment. Originally, Brock Glenn was planning to commit around the Elite 11, which is the last few days of June. He pushed that back because LSU jumped in the picture. Here we are 10 or so days into July, and it starts coming about that he's ready to make a decision. I'd been conversing with him on and off in the first 10 days of July, just kind of seeing, are you close to a commitment? Where do things stand? Are you going to have to take a visit that last week of July before you make a decision? And he wasn't real sure. When we spoke to him yesterday, Sinone might be able to reference the exact quote he shared in the update he wrote last evening. But he essentially comes down to there's a belief that Brock Glenn is closing in on that decision that FSU is probably the most likely spot. Auburn, a lot of people thought, would be the spot. Some of the crystal balls that are now on FSU 
were moved off of Auburn to FSU here in recent days. And people in Auburn circles definitely think that FSU is one trending here. For an Ohio State perspective on this, they're probably the other school really in the mix here right now with Brock Glenn being he visited there for an official. Ohio State is a school that's kind of waiting on Austin Novosad, a Baylor commitment, to make his ultimate decision. Uh, Texas A&M, Ohio State are two schools majorly involved there. Notre Dame just came in with an offer to Austin Novosad. So that thing's kind of gone from, oh, I'm making a decision here and now, a final one this week where he might be holding off a little bit more, might take more time. I think Ohio State's willing to wait that one out, seeing where it goes, and then figure out their quarterback situation because they have a great commitment in the 24 class and the room's in a pretty good spot. So I think it's one of those things where if they miss in 23, they can survive that. They can get away with that. I think that's benefited FSU to some degree because they are in a position when they need a 23 quarterback. They desperately want this 23 quarterback, and this is the guy that they're chasing after, and it's who they ultimately want to get. Why do they want to get Brock Glenn? I can explain that, or I can throw it to one of you guys so you can talk a little bit because I feel like I'm talking a lot. Yeah, uh, Brendan's muted, um, but <laughs> yeah, you go, get into it, Brendan. I was throwing it to you, so I really didn't have to unmute myself either. Thank you for throwing it to me while you're muted. Um, yeah, so Brock Glenn, um, you know, Florida State feels like he is the perfect fit for what Mike Norvell wants to do um, in his offensive scheme. I've heard, you know, people uh, close to the program compare him to, you know, past uh, quarterbacks that that Norvell's had at Memphis and Arizona State. Um, yeah, I mean, they just really like him. He's from the Memphis area. They've known him for a while. They're really close with the coaching staff um, at his at, at, at the school, Lausanne Collegiate Prep, I believe the school's called um, over there in Memphis. So that's where the connections kind of started. Um, Cooper Williams uh, from that area uh, kind of, you know, involved there. Justin Krause. There, there's a bunch of guys from the form, from Norvell's former Memphis staff that are, that are close with that coaching staff um, at, at Glens High School. Um, and that's where this, you know, interest kind of peaked. They really like him as a player. Um, obviously, they got to, you know, see him work uh, in the eval period with, between April and May. Um, Tony Tokar has made his way out there to, to watch Glenn throw. Um, yeah, I mean, he's their guy. I mean, they, they offered the two guys, like Chris mentioned, Ricky Collins and Brock Glenn. And, and coming to the, that June 10th official visit weekend, it was pretty clear that Brock Glenn was going to be the guy moving forward, um, besides obviously wanting to keep Chris Parson in the class. And obviously, going forward, Parson and Glenn are going to be compared if Glenn ends, ends up in FSU's class and enrolled. Their ranking right now, they're pretty similar. They're both in the 300s, I believe, nationally in the composite. One's the number 16 quarterback, that's Parson. The other one's the 18th quarterback, that's Glenn. So they're very similar in that regard. They both went to the Elite 11. Parson made the Elite 11 final list. I believe Glenn did not. Correct me if I'm incorrect on that, but I believe correct. that's the case. Glenn had um, a fairly pedestrian showing yeah. uh, out in California. So Parson's a guy who can really push it down the field really, really well. Strong arm, big arm. I think Glenn's guy is a little bit better at dotting it around the field, moving it around the field. Um, they both have strengths. They're both good quarterbacks. They're both going to land at, you know, P5 type schools um, for a reason. Sonny 30, kind of what we're talking about. Sonny 30 asks, sorry, this is already discussed, but who do the 24 and FSU staff like better, Glenn or Parson? So FSU staff, pretty confident uh, universally. Uh, Brock Glenn is the guy they, they had higher on the board, and, and that's why they were – willing to roll the dice on potentially losing Chris to have the chance of getting Brock Glenn. Um, and in past discussions about Chris Parson, and we've pointed out, you know, Chris Parson was recruited to FSU when there was a different OC, different quarterbacks coach than there currently is. To some degree, this whole situation, decommitment, hopefully new commitment, it's Tony Tokar's putting his stamp on that position for better or for worse. And Mike Norvell is obviously involved in every decision made. And it's obviously his offense, and he's going to have a say in it. So I don't want to act like he's not part of this. But I do think there's a point to be made that the guy who's going to be working with a quarterback on a daily basis, I think Brock Glenn's the guy that he really wants to work with. And I don't think he didn't want to work with Chris Parson. I think he was completely open to the idea. But I do think it's worth mentioning that Brock Glenn simply seems like the guy he's gravitated towards wanting. And that makes total sense that, that the quarterback coach would put his fingerprints on the quarterback recruiting, right? Uh, and – and time will tell, like, this was a calculated gamble by Tony Tokars, knowing this was something that could happen right now. At this very moment, Florida State has zero quarterback commitments. So, you know, you have to 
if you come away without Brock Lynn, then all of a sudden you're you're going to plan C options uh, pretty late in the cycle as far as quarterback recruiting is concerned. It's usually all kind of buttoned up in the summertime. Uh, for us personally, I know when, when we did a, a show with uh, the X's and Knowles guys uh, about a month ago, early early June, uh, my thought was I, I liked Brock Glenn of the three that they had offered. So Chris Parson, Brock Glenn, and Ricky Collins. I thought Brock Glenn for what FSU wants to do is the better fit. So that was just my own personal opinion. Was then, again, this isn't a hindsight kind of deal. Like I like, I like Brock Glenn. Uh, yeah, I think really a lot nervous. of the discussion at that point was that we liked all three of them. Um, yeah. You know, we thought all three brought different things to the table that we thought was good. If I recall, I think my ranking was – it might have been Glenn Parson Collins or Glenn Collins Parson. I didn't see a great divide between those two. I do like Glenn a lot. Uh, you know, I think some people are down on him because he's Elite 11 performance, but I think he's got a lot to his toolbox that he can bring to the game. I saw someone in the chat mention, you know, whether – we have intel on any imminent news. Um, I asked about that specifically um, w within the past hour. And I was told that that uh, there doesn't seem to be any imminent news, but that FSU feels really good about where they stand with. Do we lose? Do we lose Zach or do we lose me? No, we lost Zach. Zach just mid sentence froze up. His face is stuck in the same position. But this is radio, and we must go on. All right. So, so. I. I can echo something similar. It's good that we're hearing uh, Zach's back. Zach's All right, back. continue, Zach. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Where, where did I leave off? Uh, I don't know. You, you froze. You, you we're talking start about from the, nothing start immediately from the top. imminent. Yeah. Start yeah. From the top. So not, nothing. Uh, according to you know some conversations I had within within the past hour, nothing seemed imminent with Brock Glenn and FSU. Obviously, that could change with this new development, but um, I do think FSU feels really good about where they stand with him. Um, you know, it, it looks good right now. Uh, you know, obviously, like we uh, alluded to earlier, Ohio State seems like the top competition with Auburn also in the mix. And then LSU, that the newest offer, um, you know, they're trying to make a late run as well. But right now, it, you know, if I had to put in a crystal ball like my like my guy, Chris Nee, on, on the so-called sabbatical did, um, it would be for Florida State. For do, you, do you feel violated by that, Zach? Chris said no more crystal balls. And all of a sudden, boom, two. You left me out on the sabbatical island. I got to keep you guys on your toes. That's all it is. So 26 hours ago in one minute. So 5.17 p.m. yesterday, I hit up Brock Glenn and I asked, are you on the verge of a commitment to FSU? Just being ultra direct because obviously things were kind of flying fast and heavy with him. He said, as of right now, I'm still taking everything day to day. And that's been kind of the consistency with Brock is that he, he did want to decide in late June. The late offer by LSU kind of made it a little bit more difficult. The Ohio State situation caused a little hesitation that's been consistent, but FSU has done a good job with him and they felt very good exiting that visit now a month ago on the 12th of June when he wrapped up his official. And I don't think that's really ever worn off. I think they've built a very good bond with him. Some of those immediately around him, there's a relationship that dates back to his school from some of the staff's time at Memphis. that I don't think it's hurting FSU's cause at all. And I think that's why they're comfortable with what transpired this evening being something that doesn't put them in a situation where it's going to be zero or something, where they walk away and have nobody, which was always kind of the doomsday situation we were kind of scared might occur. I don't think FSU believe that, believes that's going to occur. That's why I went ahead and entered my CB. And Brock Glenn, uh, one other thing Chris mentioned, uh, Memphis high school coaches. I think Memphis, the high school he's at, runs a very similar system to what Mike Norvell runs currently, what he ran when he was at Memphis. I would imagine probably learned a couple things uh, since Mike Norvell is so open with uh, regional, local coaching staffs brought Glenn's on record as saying like that fact that Florida state runs such a similar offense is extremely important to him. Uh, so that I think has bits of the FSU staff has done a really good job kind of hammering home to Brock Glenn. I'll uh, just kind of adding to what Zach's Intel was uh, what Chris had and talking to Brock Glenn yesterday. I put something up at Knowles 24 seven, just kind of what I was hearing very similar to what Zach uh, referenced today. I think that's really good that we're hearing very similar things from uh, presumably different people uh, about the timeline for, for Brock Glenn, which we believe uh, when I wrote it yesterday, could be within a few days making a commitment somewhere or maybe by the end of the month. But the end goal is before uh, start of senior season, uh, which is coming up pretty soon. Uh, and that Florida State feel really good about its its position where it's at. So, 
yeah, I, I think right now I'm not going to do a crystal ball. That's not something I'm super interested in right now. Uh, so far, me not putting in crystal balls has been a really good luck charm for Florida State. So I'll I'll keep that keep that going for now, uh, which is a better good luck charm than me rocking the tank top, which is probably the last time we did uh, some live videos on here. Uh, so anything thinking else? back to well, real quick, thinking back to the end of May when this began to play out with new offers of quarterbacks and such, we consistently said the staff has essentially led us to believe they want two quarterbacks. Do we still think at the end of the day, they end up with two quarterbacks in this class in some form or fashion? I don't think they do from the high school ranks. I, but I do think I'm, it's not outside the realm of possibility that they bring in two quarterbacks before the next season begins. Uh, how can I say this diplomatically? If, if those two, I know, sorry, I know the phone's texting. I have it on for a reason. I'm hopeful to get calls later uh, this evening. Um, if, if the two quarterbacks were Chris Parson and Brock Lynn or Ricky Collins, yes, they would have taken two. Uh, if one of the quarterbacks was Brock Lynn, I don't think they'll be in a rush to take a second. I, does that make sense? Like, I, I think Brock Lynn was the guy they wanted uh, when this all started, and Ricky Collins would have been uh, really good too. But since May, I think one, I think they wanted one quarterback. And it was either of those two. And Chris Parson would have been a really nice cherry on top. They would have been happy to have him and to work with him. Uh, but that that's what I ultimately believe. So if you get Brock Glenn, which you guys are feeling pretty good about, uh, I I think that this ultimately ends with Brock Glenn for this recruiting cycle. And then do you think they go in the portal for another one? I think depending yeah. on what happens with Jordan Travis. I know our belief is that this is probably his last season at Florida State. Uh, we'll see. I guess it depends on how the year unfolds. Like if he has a, a above average year, but maybe not a, a good one, uh, but not a below average year either. Uh, maybe there's a chance he comes back and, and you try to work on some things like incentives with NIL or something for him to come back. But right now I, I think, yeah, you, you probably need to add uh, someone with at least a little bit of experience for the quarterback room for, for 2023. Yeah. It feels like that October 15th to November 1st evaluation when you're starting to try to figure out, roster construction for the next year with what you've seen from this year whether it's guys who may depart early or for whatever reason or guys that you've seen and oh man that kid showed me something i feel pretty good about what we have at this spot uh people are asking in the chat did glenn struggle at the elite 11 so interesting so he did struggle at the elite 11 finals in california uh it was not a it, uh, bud elliott talked about this because he was out there uh, apparently Brock's like a game. His best ball was like really impressive. It seemed like the kid was really kind of hyped that week, trying to make a statement and uh, wasn't really playing within himself. So it was not a good few days for him. Uh, conversely at the regionals in Nashville that Zach was at uh, Brock Glenn, I think placed second with a pretty good group. Avery Johnson was there. Chris Parson was there. He finished ahead of Chris there. So there's been good days in that setting as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know like if they had a direct ranking at that one, but he was within the top three, which included Nico Amalavea and uh, Avery Johnson as well in that top three that got the instant uh, invite to the finals at, in that Nashville regional. Um, he looked really good. Um, but yeah, that kind of makes sense, you know, with him heading out all the way to LA and, and trying to make a statement um, out there. Um, you know, I think he finished a little bit above Parson in the pro day. Um, but struggled some in, in the other days. That pro day was that second day out there. Um, I think he finished with like 14 out of 20 completions, whereas Parson was like 12 out of 20. Um, so it was close. Um, both those guys weren't, you know, towards the top on that day. But I think Parson performed better overall in the entirety of the event. Okay. I think that's everything that we had to touch on for this emergency podcast. Um Zach, can we get a Matthew McConaughey? All right, all right, all right. No, you know what? Let's save it for if they get a Brock Glenn commitment, okay? Yeah. All right. So for now, we're just going to end the podcast normally, as normally as I can possibly make it. For Chris Nee, Zach Blossin, I'm Brendan Sinone. This has been On the Bench. Thanks, for everyone, for watching. If you're listening to this on the podcast form, thank you for listening. Check out Nose 24-7 for future content and a pretty cool announcement uh, on the future of On the Bench and some of the, the stuff we'll be putting out later. All right. Stick in the landing. Goodbye.